Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to those here in LA and for anyone who may be joining us from out of town. My name is Jen Maxey. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Holocaust Museum LA. And we're thrilled to be presenting this conversation tonight, the second film in our Tykoltz film series, Martha Lieberman, A Stolen Life. And for anyone interested, we do still have three films left. Two are virtual and our last film is in person here in Los Angeles. So please head over to hmla.org to RSVP for any of those, and they are all free. For anyone out there not familiar with Holocaust Museum LA, we are the oldest and the first survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the country. We are here to preserve memory, commemorate those who perished and honor those who survived. And we hope to inspire greater humanity through truth. We're very proud to be at the forefront of helping to combat bigotry, anti-Semitism and discrimination in all its insidious forms. And we do this by sharing the stories and true histories of the Holocaust as lessons that remain relevant today. And many of these accounts are spoken firsthand by the community of Holocaust survivors here in Los Angeles that we are privileged to work with. Tonight, we're here to talk about the film Martha Lieberman, A True Story, which deals with a range of complex issues related to the dangers that Jewish citizens faced in Germany during the Nazi regime, regardless of whether they had at one time been highly respected in society. We see too the extraordinary courage of those who sought to help their fellow citizens escape to safety and some of the excruciating choices that individuals were faced with. We're joined tonight, very pleased to be joined tonight by Professor Helga Schreckenberger, who is the chair of the Department of German and Russian Studies at the University of Vermont and a scholar on the Holocaust. And I should mention that our very own Vice President of Education and Exhibitions, Jordana Gessler, was a student of Professor Schreckenberger's, so we are grateful for her impact as an educator. Helga is joined tonight by Dr. Holly Levitsky, who is the founder and director of the Jewish Studies Program at Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. In addition to numerous distinctions, Holly also served as a fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Our moderator tonight is Tom Teicholtz, award-winning journalist and second-generation descendant of Holocaust survivors. Our series is named for Tom's parents. So we will leave some time. We're gonna have some discussion. We will leave some time for audience questions tonight, which you can drop in the Q&A function at any time and Tom will get to those at the end. So without further ado, Helga, Holly and Tom, take it away. Hi. Um, welcome all. Uh, I want to thank, um, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Schreckenberger and Holly for joining me tonight. Um, they're both uh, return guests to this series, and I'm really grateful for their uh, participation and continued participation. I also want to thank the Leo and Rita Greenland Foundation for supporting the series. And I want to uh, give a particular shout out to the Thomas Mann House and Villa Aurora in LA who uh, supported this screening and this discussion. Um, they are great friends uh, to the museum and a great uh, place for anyone who's in LA to check out their programming. Um, so let's begin uh, our discussion tonight of um, Martha Lieberman's story. First, I wanted to ask you, Helga, to tell us a little bit about Max Lieberman, uh, Martha's husband, the artist, and his the position, the special position he held in German society and uh, in Berlin, uh, in particular, before the war. All right. Well, Max Lieberman was important for at least two factors. First, he was considered during his lifetime as the leading German Impressionist painter. And second, and maybe even more important, was his role in transforming the German cultural uh, scene uh, from a very, um, yeah, very conservative, anti-modernist uh, atmosphere to a very open, uh, 
uh, open to, to new art and to modernism in general. So he was born in 1847 in Berlin, and uh, he was the middle son of a upper class Jewish family. His father was the head of, um, a, of a, a textile printing company that employed over a thousand people. And Max, as the middle son, was able to convince his parents that he should become an, an artist. And he first started uh, studying in, uh, in the Weimar Art School, but he also studied in Paris, in Munich, and in the Netherlands. And he started out as a naturalist and experienced an early success already in 1872 with his painting, um, Women Plugging Geese. It was, as I said, a natural, uh, naturalistic painting and it was purchased at a very high price. And it was also exhibited at the Paris Salon, which after that regularly uh, displayed uh, Lieberman's art. And um, the painting was, uh, I think the painting is already important because it sets Max Lieberman apart from the other painters, from his contemporaries. He chose to uh, portray uh, the women who were plugging geese in it was a very unusual motive. Usually, lower class people were either portrayed as comical or they were sentiment sentimentalized. And Lieberman didn't do that. He just painted them uh, very, you know, very with, with, with dignity and very uh, naturalistic. Um, and at that time, especially in, in Germany, in Berlin, after the unification of Germany, the taste ran towards the ostentatious, the grandiose, and especially the nationalistic. And so Lieberman's contemporary motives and the unusual way in which he, or the unorthodox way in which he portrayed uh, the, weav the, the, the weavers and the spinners and the goose pluckers uh, really, um, sort of ruffled some feathers and raised some eyebrows. Um, but uh, his, the, his success in France with the Paris Salon also uh, got him noticed in Berlin. And he was considered as one of the more promising uh, young artists. And that didn't change even when he started to move away from naturalism towards impressionist, impressionism, which was not considered a very, um, uh, very good art. Most uh, people, in, especially the cultural conservatives, saw Impressionism as unfinished, as really an improper way of seeing. But um, Max Lieberman was able to withstand that early rejection of the of Expressionism, and he um, he really started to receive a lot of accolades. He was uh, uh, he became a member of the Royal Academy. He received the title of professor, and he was also awarded a gold medal for his art. But at the same time, he tried to change the atmosphere in Berlin and tried to make it more receptive to modern art um, and make it more tolerant to uh, innovate of innovation, uh, which the cultural conservative and especially uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who abhorred modern art, uh, really resented. And uh, there was an uh, there was um, a, an event where Kate Kollwitz was supposed to get uh, the gold medal for her painting of Gerhard Hauptmann's The Weavers, and uh, the Kaiser intervened, and she didn't get her medal. And that really incensed people like Lieberman. And 65 artists, together with Lieberman, formed the, Ber uh, the Berlin Secession, and, and they elected Lieberman as the president, which was really indicative of his standing within the, the cultural and artistic scene in Germany at that time. And uh, I believe he also had great success as a teacher. He, he became the head of the Prussian Art Academy. Yeah, but uh, that, that was, yes. That was a little bit later. First, he had the title of professor was non-teaching, but he did become the head of the of the uh, Prussian Academy. 
So anyway, so the uh, the Berlin Secession started their own galleries and their own shows and became an alternative to the more conservative art in Germany. And um, uh, and it really became a very effective alternative to the shows at the Royal Academy and the Verein Berliner Künste. So uh, Lieberman was really regarded as a national spokesman for fine art, despite the opposition of the cultural conservatives, and especially that of the Kaiser, who uh, really uh, became uh, a, a, a strong uh, opponent of Liebermann's. For example, he intervened and vetoed a retrospective of Liebermann's art in 1907. Um, but uh, Liebermann's reputation survived, and it even survived World War One and the uh, the end of the of the German Empire, and then in 1920 he was uh, that's when he was uh, he was elected president of the Prussian Academy, which previously was the the Royal Academy, um, and he was president of that organization of the well, of the Prussian Academy until 1932 when at age uh, 84 he did not he he elected not to stand for election again um that of course changed when the nazis came into power because they stripped him of all his titles all his honors and um they also pre uh, prohibited him uh hit, hit from exhibiting his work so um but until that point uh, until 1932 i mean lieberman really was very respected, very well established within the German uh, art uh, community and also the business community because it was very, very successful. And he was also consulting with museum directors, with curators and um, advised them, consulted about modern art, especially the, the Impressionists and the French painters. And he brought painters like Monet and uh, to the, to Berlin, to the museums, to the shows, uh, and then his family connection also got him in touch with leaders in the business world, and he he was commission he got lots of commissions to do portraits, and again he uh, he then consulted with buyers of art. Uh, as we know from the film, he also had a very extensive art collection, and he loaned it or he, he he donated it to museums. So he really was a very uh, shaping force within the German um, art scene and, and contributed to the transformation of the conservative cultural scene to a more open um, modernist um, uh, scene. And, 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 uh, sorry, I was sorry, just going to no, say ahead. that, that, that um, uh, he had been awarded the um, uh, highest honor in Berlin and, and was beloved in Berlin. But when, as you said, uh, when the uh, Nazis came to power in 1933, all that went away. And as we see in the film, um, he only lived, uh, I believe he passed away in 35. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I mean he, was, he was the target of anti-Semitism already before that. I mean, first of all, he was Jewish, although he and his family were strong believers in assimilation. They did believe that uh, assimilation would overcome anti-Semitism. And initially, he was also strongly opposed to Zionism, except in 1933, he then changed his mind and he said that he was wrong. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, his paintings were criticized by, uh, uh, first of all, because he was Jewish, but also because the way he, uh, of the way he was painting. I mean, Impressionism was seen as something foreign that was imported from France and was opposed to the nationalism and the patriotism of the art that uh, the, the Kaiser, for example, the cultural conservatives promoted. And so th this was seen as difficult Jewish to infiltrate German culture with some foreign 
ideas. That and I believe when they had him. the infamous degenerate art exhibition, he was one of the mm -hmm. artists uh, mm -hmm. in that. But I want to now turn to uh, the real subject of the film, which is uh, Martha Lieberman and uh, his widow. And um, in this film, we are presented with a story in some, in one way of a very um, uh, haughty, bourgeois, um, uh, uh, wealthy, uh, upper class kind of person who uh, uh, in some ways uh, doesn't uh, feel she is sort of above the treatment of the other Jews and doesn't want to um, in any way um, diminish her life or stature. But, um, and this is what I wanted to ask you, Holly, about. I think recently, in recent years, um, uh, among the academic community and among uh, writers and historians, we're coming to think more broadly about what constitute resistance. And so I wanted you to talk about a little bit about resistance, and then I want to open up a conversation with you and Helga about Martha Lieberman's forms of resistance as we see in this movie. So Holly, please. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, and thank you, Helga, for that background on Max Lieberman. I mean, organized armed resistance um, with remains, no matter how else we look at resistance during the Holocaust, it remains the most forceful form of not just Jewish opposition to Nazi policies in German-occupied Europe, but any, any opposition at all. I mean, armed resistance, organized armed resistance was the most forceful form of resistance, but there were so many other forms of resistance. Um, many which you can imagine, you know, we don't have to have to think about it as new forms of resistance at all. These are forms of resistance that have been around as long as, uh, you know, we've tried to fight opposition. Uh, traditionally, you know, there were ghetto uprisings, there were uh, concentration camp uprisings um, from the prisoners against the guards, but also coming in from the outside, partisans, uh, people in the community, there were assaults um, by the partisans. There was aid and rescue by Jewish organizations and other kinds of organizations. Um, the Goda, for instance, in Poland. Um, there were all sorts of uh, organized individual and collective forms of resistance, including uh, one of my fa favorite stories, Le Chambon sur l'Union, the Protestant village in Southern France that saved thousands of Jews. Um, and when asked why, they said, of course, there, there's, you don't need a reason. We save people because they're people and uh, just like us. And you know, from that all the way to um, you know, the, the other forms of resistance that perhaps are much more traditional versions where you're you're helping or you're allied with someone because you're getting something out of it. For, Le Cham for, the, for the citizens of Le Chambon um, sur Lignon, there, there was nothing they were They were doing it uh, altruistically. Um, and then I think, Tom, just to your question more directly, I think over time, um, both historians and you know, cultural analysts like myself, we've come to see so many other forms of resistance. And I suppose you could call it spiritual resistance on the one hand. So, you know, if uh, Hitler wanted to destroy the Jewish people, practicing Judaism is itself a form of resistance considering uh, continuing to practice the rituals and the rites and so on. Um, and we can also not just think of, you know, we think of genocide, we mostly think of uh, the genocide of, of people, but there's cultural genocide that is very much a part of the word as it was, uh, the word as it developed. And the idea that you could wipe out a culture, that you could eliminate its um, material pieces, um, the fragments and the, the um, you know, actual 
uh, parts of what make um, you know what what makes Judaism Judaism that you could wipe that out and that too would be a form of genocide. So I think one of the things we've been doing more and more in terms of um, not just archiving but opening archives. Um, Bad Arlson in Germany when that archive was opened, I think I don't even remember the number, but it was mind-boggling how many documents uh, the Nazis had stored in there that was just opened, what, maybe 15 years ago? Mihalga, I think you would know probably more about that, but I was just dumbfounded when I discovered that there are, were then, when Bad Arlson was opened, but then since then, just all sorts of discoveries of documents, of not just material documents about you know, uh, villages or or artifacts, but people. We're learning more and more about the people. So in my mind, each time one of those people are resurrected, one of those victims is resurrect, uh, resurrected or, um, you know, we found um, you know, new places where Jews had been murdered or kept. All of these things to me, this is like a resurrection. And in that way, it seems to me, the resurrection itself becomes a form of uh, resistance. And I mean, maybe the most famous one is the Onig Shabbat uh, archives uh, in, in Warsaw uh, that Emanuel Ringelblum, an historian, even in the darkest and you know, penultimate hours uh, of his life, he was still collecting and preparing so that um, you know, those in the future would find it and find out um, that there was resistance just in the fact of writing down what was happening, that record resistance. So, Tom, just again, to go back to your question, I think, you know, those have always been there, those possibilities yes. of discovering more. It's always been there, but I think now we take it so seriously, every single archive that we open up, every piece of the past. Um, that we're able uh, to find, that becomes another piece of the resistance of the Jewish people. You know, I, um, my father, who was uh, in the resistance, a leader of the resistance in Hungary, used to go around and speak to high schools uh, when I was a kid, to, to high school students. And uh, what he uh, said in every speech uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, people always, and this was more true then than now, but people will say, how how is it possible that the Jews were led to slaughter without resisting? And my father would say, uh, there was resistance everywhere. In small places, it might have been small instances of resistance, and in large places, it was large instances of resistance. But um, th there was resistance everywhere. And I think, you know, um, in the movie, uh, in Martha, in the Martha Lieberman uh, uh, movie, um, even maintaining your dignity is a form of resistance. Maintaining your insisting on a certain quality of life, in her case, was a form of resistance. And um, and then obviously, uh, at the end of the movie, not allowing the uh, Germans to send her to Theresienstadt was, in her own way, an ultimate form of resistance, uh, uh, I thought. Uh, Helga, I'm going to uh, turn it to you, turn to you now to talk about Martha Lieberman a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all the things that you mentioned, I think from her perspective, and as the spectator, as the audience, I think we are supposed to, to see it also that she did resist in her way by not, she said uh, in, in that one scene where she said, I've never broken the law. And the young woman says, but these laws are made by lawless people. And she says, so do you want me to, to sink to their level? So for her, it was, you know, saying, no, I'm not going to become like them. I'm not going to lose my integrity by falling, by, by, by sinking to their level. So yes, I think, and 
especially her suicide, her selecting how she was going to die, even though that in, in the you know in the film that drives the Dreibner crazy that he loses that control over her. I think that was was a big step of resistance on her part. Yeah. I and really yeah, and in the film, uh the other characters surrounding her um present a different possible responses to the um uh, Nazi uh administration. Um uh, so for example, um uh, we have her housekeeper who stays with her uh, um, even when uh, Nazi law forbade uh, her to uh, forbade uh, Gentiles to work, be employed by Jews. Um, and she was a quite um, uh, um, a strong character uh, throughout the film. Um, and presented a, a certainly a model who was willing to even leave the country if she had to with Martha, if that's what it took to continue to take care of her. Uh, uh, any thoughts on that, uh, Holly, Helga? Yeah, I mean, I was very struck by the line um, when she goes into the hospital in her coma and he says, um, Jews don't get to choose when they die. And he wanted the doctor to revive her at, at all costs, even of his own life. And uh, to hear that said aloud really drives home the idea of how dehumanized the Nazis were trying to make the Jews in the eyes of everyone else. So dehumanized that they didn't even get to choose their own death or choose to die um, when they wanted to or went, you know, in her case, taking the pills and instead of going off being shipped to Teresian shop. But I was so taken by that because it's such a level of dehumanization to take away even that last moment of the human life from your autonomy. But I was also really taken with the housekeeper. And I thought, you know, she she was her own form of resistance. I mean, yes, the salt, the salt group, um, you know, was a historical group, and there were some other groups um, like that, the White Rose and other groups who, you know, were organized, non-Jewish groups organized um, into resistance groups. But for her, it was just, you know, she was a simple housekeeper who took her duty absolutely seriously and um, and was not, you know, was not going to leave her employer no matter what, even if her employer forced her out of the house. In her mind, she was still in, you know, in employ, which to her, I think, meant this uh, absolute loyalty. Absolutely. And so it was not even a question when she was faced with, you know, are, you're going to be arrested. How dare you do this? You're not allowed to do it. In her, you know, the, the actor, I think, was very good at just looking blankly at, at the camera or or at the at the Nazi and not even saying anything, but conveying that sense that I am here as an absolute uh, loyal member and nothing, you know, this this is my form of resistance. So I was really taken by that. And um, yeah, I, I just thought there were there were resistant, there were forms of resistance in both the Jewish and non-Jewish characters that were very different, but you got the sense that it also conveyed the range of resistance that was going on at the time. So it yeah. wasn't just Jews who had to resist. It was also, you know, these other groups and the housekeeper in this, in this instance, et cetera. Yeah, for me, the housekeeper almost reminded me of a figure from Max Lieberman's paintings. As I mentioned at the beginning, mm. he, he gave simple people a dignity and for me the housekeeper had a great deal of dignity you you said the way how she spoke to the nazis how she kept her countenance and her her her, her posture and um so in, in a way 
for me, she, I, I was wondering if, because she is, as it said at the, at the end, she is a fictitious um, figure in yeah. the film. So if the filmmakers hadn't looked at Max Liebermann's paintings and portrayals of the so-called mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. people and, and took that as a model for the housekeeper. Yeah, I think that's that a wonderful great. observation. Uh, um, and then of, also there is the um, sort of self-interested ally, uh, which is the art dealer, the young art mm -hmm. dealer, who um, is helping her, but obviously um, doing so, you know, for his own personal benefit. But that's okay too, you know, I, I think that that um, we don't have to uh, we don't have to judge someone necessarily in this kind of a situation by their motives, but by their we judge we can judge them by their actions. So I thought it was interesting to include him uh, as a character as well. Uh, Helga, did you have any reaction to the art dealer? Uh, well. Um... Yes, you. Uh, I mean, he he was. Uh, I mean, in his way, he was resisting the Nazis because he did not disclose that the painting was um, uh, was uh, a forgery. Although he he of course noticed it immediately, and he did. Uh, I mean, he was trying to save somebody else, and then uh, and use his connections with Martin Lieberman as he had before before. Uh, the Nazis came to power. She had helped. Actually, she had furthered his career quite a bit. So um, he did owe her, but he did not. I mean, it. Um, I mean, his resistance certainly was not at the same level as the housekeeper, who was no. much straightforward. I mean, he tried to play the game. He tried to play along with the Nazis, and he had a reason for it. He was protecting his lover. And um, he was, so he, he was resisting, but he was uh, for, uh, and he he was playing the game for a good reason. But I think uh, the film sort of really uh, judges him at the end when his lover shoots himself by saying, mm -hmm. okay, you saved me, but at what, what price? And I cannot live with that. So for me, actually the lover then become is another for uh, displays another form of resistance by saying I will not be saved with the life of innocent people that's not that doesn't make my life worthwhile living so yes I, yeah. I, 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 I feel very ambivalent about the art dealer I have to say yeah and I, I think yeah. it was very interesting choice of the filmmaker to include such a uh, shaded character um, uh, um, and by the way, I mean, uh, 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 you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I believe Lieberman had the largest collection of Impressionist paintings in Germany. A and uh, after Mark, and I, I, I believe that they were able to smuggle out about 47 of his own paintings to Switzerland. Um, um, but most of his collection, including his portrait of Martha Lieberman, was looted after her death. Yeah, um, that's correct. So, so, so um, but Holly, did, did you have something you want to say about the uh, art dealer? Yeah, no, what I wanted to say, yes, um, because what I loved about um, that in this film was creating that gray area. And I always have a problem with films or literature about the Holocaust where we just see things in black and white. You know, even Schindler's List, I think that's a, I wish I was just teaching earlier tonight. I think that's a, a really valuable film to show, you know, the nuance of human behavior, the gray areas that, you know, sometimes get overlooked, the gray areas of behavior and motivation that often get overlooked when we're talking about the Holocaust. Uh, you could be a perpetrator and a rescuer at the same time. You could be a victim and a perpetrator at the same time. You could be a bystander and a, you know, you could, these categories of behavior in the Holocaust get all mixed up at times. And in this film, 
I think especially with the art dealer, we do have, you know, um, some very resolute characters um, like the housekeeper, but then with the art dealer, you know, we have someone who's just moving with the information as it changes somewhat, you know, like we see in Schindler. And, um, and I appreciate that because I'm going to guess that more behavior was like that during the Holocaust than was altruistic, um, you know, or sort of just in one category. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we also see that the, that even the people who are wanting to do good, the smugglers, the, you know, the sort of underground network were severely limited uh, and were, were heavily watched. Uh, um, and uh, um, so those characters are, were also interesting in the movie. Um, you know, uh, uh, um, it really does give us a, in this one story, such a range of different um, uh, reactions or ways of responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Helga? I was just thinking, what did you think about the cab driver? I mean, that seems... Oh, yes. That, yeah. I mean, there also seem to be some... I think it's very that. human that, that, that you know, uh, um, if there's someone that you hold in great respect and suddenly the government or the culture uh, tells you not to anymore. Um, uh, some people are not going to be able to, aren't going to give that up. They're still going to, uh, um, you know, um, in their heart of hearts, respect them. And I think, you know, not to go too far afield, but we're living through a lot of that today um, when there are artists that we used to respect who now we know that uh, uh, different aspects of their personal life or their behaviors, and we try and separate, and we can't separate them from their artworks, or we try to, you know, it's, it's uh, these are complicated emotions, but very human ones, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, one of the other things that the movie does bring up, which I just mentioned before, was the question of looted art. A and, um, uh, you know, I mean, the Holocaust Museum itself um, is a beneficiary of Randy Schoenberg um, fighting to get the Klimt painting back. And I believe there were Liebermans that have turned up that are still and Lieberman's that are still missing. Um, yeah. Much of his uh, much of his collection is still missing, um, and looted art is, continues to be a big uh, subject. Um, is this something that you cover at all, Helga, in your courses and discuss? Actually, not. I have not ventured in that area. But um, I was just um, a, a second reader of, uh, of, a, of an MA thesis of an art historian, student in art history at UVM. And she found a painting in, in the collection of the art museum, our art museum on campus, the Fleming Museum. And it's, uh, it wasn't quite sure how it came into the possession of the museum. And so her thesis was to, to, to follow the painting. It was a French painting. Um, and she was actually able to establish that it was legally purchased uh, mm -hmm. by the art museum. But that was, uh, that was a blind spot in the collection. That they, and they had to admit they have some paintings in their collections where they are not sure how it came into their possession. So that even that small little art museum at the University of Vermont has, yeah. you know, has some, some dark spots that need to be investigated. And that was for me, that was a big eye opener. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we go to questions, which we'll do shortly, um, Holly, anything else you wanted to bring up regarding the film? 
Um, well, just to follow up a little bit about what, what Helga was just saying, what you'd asked, you know, the provenance of art is so important. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm imagining that, you know, like the archives that continue to be uh, discovered and open, that we're going to be dealing with, um, you know, the theft of, of this, this massive theft of property by the Nazis for many years yet to come. And uh, also that it was, you know, the, the Holocaust was um, a great theft, you know, I mean, great with a capital G, uh, material that was stolen from Jews, um, not just the artwork, not just the looted art, but so many other things. You know, one has to wonder, I guess, uh, going into the future, will that ever be, you know, will, will families ever get those items or their worth back. Um, that was just one thing. I mean, the other thing that really, that really struck me, um, you know, about the film, uh, I mean, there were so many things, but I think mostly for me, the film really showed me um, how the massive talent that was lost in the Holocaust, that not just the Max Liebermans, and I know he, he passed a few years, uh, what was it, 1935, I think, so before, you know, it formally began, but certainly after um, Hitler, I think, came in 33. So, you know, it, but just the, the talent, the, the, the artist, but also all of the other talent that was lost, it just strikes me so much because when you see Martha Lieberman in the film, looking at the paintings, she looks at those paintings as if she's looking at her own children. You know, the love that she has when she looks at the paintings and you can see her consider, you know, can I just leave these? Can I just, you know, go join my daughter? Or can, you know, can I, can I run off from this? Can I go with this or that person and be saved myself personally? And she looks at the paintings and the paintings as if speak to her and say, no, you can't leave us behind. Um, and she knows, you know, it's the great talent, um, you know, of her husband that produced him and also was it Storn, I think, who produced um, the other paintings. But it, it just, it, it was just such a tear at the heart to see how much those paintings meant. And, you know, we tend to think of material things as material things, you know, you're gonna save your life or you're gonna save a painting. And, you know, when, when that question was put to us in this film, surely, or put to Martha, you know, surely we saw her choose the painting, uh -huh. you know, up until the very end. Right. And, and that was just awesome to me, you know, capital A, awesome to me to, to see that. And, and, you know, what's also interesting is that, is that so many of the artists who were uh, suppressed and erased uh, by the Nazis, um, it really, uh, you know, many of them uh, sort of, Lieberman is not that well known today, you know, uh, as he was clearly before Hitler came to power. And there are um, a good number of uh, particularly music composers who were murdered by the Nazis whose music is rarely played today, even though they were extremely popular in Europe uh, in the 20s and early 30s. And so you're right, there is a, um, a cultural murder that, uh, that also occurred at the same time. And, um, uh, and one other thing that I, I was struck by is that, and is that, when we see Martha Lieberman commit suicide, you know, when people talk about those murdered by the Nazis, right? We mostly think about the people who were murdered at the concentration camps, but there were artists and individuals clearly who took their own lives um, and they should be remembered too. You know, uh, even uh, Stefan Zweig in Brazil committing suicide uh, clearly did so because of the reality uh, that the Nazis were creating. And it's uh, that loss. Um, I think this movie 
uh, brings that home in a way that I maybe didn't think about it before. Um, Helga, uh, I'm going to get, let you comment and then I will see if there's any questions. Uh, about the loss of, uh, of talent and uh, the people who, who took their own lives. I mean, among artists, I mean, uh, that there was quite a bit of uh, cases of suicide. Ernst Toller. I mean, those were people who had already escaped, as you said, Stefan Zweig. But Ernst Toller, Hasenkleber, well, no, Hasenkleber was in, in the concentration camp when he con uh, com committed suicide. But a number of people um, uh, uh, rather took their own life than fall into the hands of the Nazis or just despaired about the new reality, as you said. And, yeah. um, and uh, to, the, to the loss of uh, talent, I mean, some people's, careers just got they, they they didn't even die but the careers got cut short yes if when they emigrated when they had to leave germany they could not they could not re-establish them in a foreign country because they were writing in in german and they didn't have the resources to have the or the the reputation to have the name the uh, the works translated the musicians that you mentioned who came to other countries and could never rekindle their their careers. Yeah. That, yeah, and we, we mentioned uh, yeah, it's, we mentioned earlier that Thomas Mann House, well, you know, Heinrich Mann was perhaps more famous than his brother before the war, yeah. but once he came to LA, Hein Thomas Mann kept making radio dresses and writing novels, but yeah. Heinrich Mann sort of lost lost influence and yeah. and, and uh you know Schoenberg continued to make music but Korngold is not as remembered as he was before the war and yes I think that's a uh, I think that's a very valid point uh, that 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 the impact even among those who survived was what was a heavy price to pay now I will say that in the in the questions um in fact, we've addressed uh, one about the fictional housekeeper, and um, one is more of a comment. But someone asked about um, the blank sheet of paper that Martha Lieberman left in the in in the envelope, and uh, and sort of put that out as a brilliant representation of her final resistance. Um, That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, I that, thought so that was as well. Powerful. Yes, that was very powerful. So I'm going to thank you both um, um, uh, for participating tonight. Um, this was a great dis discussion about a, a from a great film that I think we all um, uh, found incredibly rich in its presentation. Um, uh, Holly, a last comment. Oh, you muted. I know, sorry. There is no <laughs> real last word um, on this film. It is a rich, beautiful film. Um, but I did want to comment about fiction because that's that's my area. I'm, I'm a literature teacher. And, you know, often the housekeeper who was a fictional character in here, uh, many of the other pieces were, um, you know, historically accurate, the, the, um, the Solf group and so on. But you know, often uh, the fictional device comes in to help us more clearly see the truth. And I think um, you're just looking at, at two of the questions in there. The other one about the mother-daughter, about Louise and Marx becoming like a mother-daughter pair. I mean, we certainly have, you know, the daughter is there. She has a daughter, but the daughter leaves. Um, and we don't see in the film, I mean, we see a little bit of her, you know, begging the, mo the mother to go, but, I just can't imagine what the real scene was like, you know, the real historical moment was like when the daughter tried to get her mother to leave with them, knowing as she did that it was going to be no good for her to stay there and the decision Martha made to stay. And, and then bringing in this fictional housekeeper to sort of, um, you know, be a daughter to her in a way there. So I, I just found it was very helpful to have the figure of Louisa almost as a foil 
then to, you know, Martha's um, uh, stubbornness, you know, her decision to just dig in her heels and stay there and, you know, just kind of be a lawful German citizen no matter what. Um, but I just felt like it was a relationship based more on a foil and to make her more kind of like a daughter, I think um, just kind of brought, again, brought, you know, made the fictional kind of make us think about the reality a little bit more. Um, I just wanted to say that. And I, I just, I also thought it was just a fabulous movie. And I want to thank you for bringing it to my attention. And I can't wait for it to come out in, in theaters. Uh, Helga, any last words? Uh, no, I think we really addressed everything and I really enjoyed our discussion and I'm going to certainly watch the film again well, and, and discover even more little things that I might not have taken into consideration yet. <laughs> well, th thank you both so much and thank you all for uh, listening to our conversation. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there are uh, three more films uh, in the series um, on the next three Thursdays. Um, the films are each very interesting. Uh, Lost uh, Transport is a fictional film about based on a um, on a true incident, um, but is a film made by a uh, written and directed by a woman and tells the story of a, a German woman, a Russian woman, and a Jew Danish Jewish woman who develop an unlikely uh, friendship in the last days of World War II. And then um, a Valiant Hearts um, tell, is also based on a true story um, about the rescue of children uh, in France and uh, our final film is, which is in person at, uh, on August 17th at the uh, Lemley Royal, is a sneak preview of a film that will be released later in the year called White Bird, in which the supporting characters are Helen Mirren and Gillian Anderson. And it's about a um, Jewish girl in, in, in France who is hidden by a family and rescued by a um, disabled boy from her class. So that's what we have to look forward to. Um, thank you. Again, go to Holocaust Museum LA to sign up for these films and uh, we'll, we'll see you in the future. And Holly and Helga, I hope you'll join us again next year uh, for one of our panel discussions. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.